Right, so today I'm going to do some wood carving. I've been making some spoons as gifts for Christmas. So I thought I would show you how I do it and uh, some of the things I've learnt. I'm not a carving expert, it's not really what I specialise in, but uh, I like doing it anyway. It's a good uh, relaxing thing to do and uh, quite good fun and you always get a unique product. It never turns out quite like you wanted or expected, but uh, it always turns out pretty good anyway, most of the time at least. I'm going to be carving some green ash today. To begin with, obviously you need to saw some wood. You can either carve green wood or um, another thing you can do is carve some like dried softwoods. I sometimes would get uh, some just pine um, planks and uh, carve them out. If you're carving for the first time, I'd probably go with something like a, a dry pine um, because when you carve green wood, sometimes it does split and it's just quite disappointing to just put time into something and then it just uh, ends up being ruined by drying out. So if you're doing your first project, you'd probably go with that so that you don't avoid too much disappointment. Obviously you have the full log. I've just split it into quarters and uh, then I can saw it into the desired lengths. So there's a knot here, so I'll make that at the top of the spoon, but I'm going to try and split it out anyway. So you're just looking to choose how big you want the spoon to be and uh, try and extract the best piece from it. At this stage you can uh, be quite careful and split stuff out but generally I go quite brutal um, because I have a good judgement on how big it needs to be. You don't want to be carving too much away, like too much bulk. It's quicker to split it off at the start. Yeah. That's pretty good. So you can see here now we've got a nice clean piece of wood with a enough size to it to be a spoon without too much excess that I'm going to have to carve off. I just want to talk briefly about the tools I'm going to be using. Obviously you just saw me use a bow saw, but you can use any saw really. It helps to have a splitting axe when you're splitting up the quarters. But uh, all you really need is of course first you need a carving hatchet. Any axe will do really as long as it's usable in one hand. But uh, there are some specific things I've found make it better. You want a nice handle that's shaped to fit your hand so it's comfortable to use for a long period of time. This handle's a little bit longer than normal. Um, this just makes it a better general purpose, but uh, about 14 inches is ideal for a carving hatchet. The head designs, well, I think the biggest uh, difference has come in. This one's got a very uh, fan shape to it with a pointed toe and heel. I found this works much better than any American style hatchet or um, basically anything that's got a flat uh, toe. This pointed heel I think becomes very important when you, you can carve into tighty areas much easier. Whereas with a flat hatchet it's, it's much harder to get into little corners and areas. So this is an old Elwell hatchet. It's quite rare, but uh, you can find basically the same head shape in any Vineland pattern. It's a German style axe. You can find very, very easily. One of the most common axe patterns in the world. So just find a nice weight one, about 600 to 800 grams, and you're good to go. 
You don't need to spend hundreds on fancy Swedish carving axes, it's really not necessary. Especially when you're starting out, often people will recommend spending a lot on your axe, but uh, I disagree. You can get a well-performing axe for next to nothing, and when you're getting into carving, you might not know if you like it or not yet, so there's no point splashing out loads of tools. And if you are going to spend money, well, you're better off getting more tools for different jobs than just like expensive and limited yourself. So this is a more of a crook knife. This is for carving out the hollows of the spoon. And then just a normal typical mower knife. This is a carbon, um, I think, pro they call it. This is a nice a bit shorter. It's just a little bit shorter and I find a really short knife is much better for carving. I do not see how anybody finds big knives useful. Big knives are terrible for carving because you need to get your hand up behind the point. The further away the point is from your hand the less leverage you have and carving is mostly about leverage and a sharp edge. Similarly with your hatchet. A good uh, handle of, made of wood allows you to move your hand up and down at different positions whereas some of the steel handles like S-wings and that sort of thing they've got a grip here like a rubber grip but the rest of it's just like a metal skeleton and uh, they're really terrible when you're trying to work like this which is quite a lot of your carving work actually so just something to consider okay so one thing that really helps and is essential is you have good sharp tools. Now, there's a lot of videos on knife sharpening, but uh, not much on what I'd say is decent axe advice. I made some videos on chopping axes, but for carving axes, it's a slightly different thing. With a carving axe, you want an absolutely flat edge. What I mean by a flat edge is it comes from the cheeks here down to an absolute angle as flat as possible. With a chopping axe normally I have a flat grind but then it gets a secondary bevel on it so it gets a little bit steeper just right at the edge. So just right at the edge normally I'll put a steeper angle on it so most of my filing is done at this angle and then I'll put another angle on it a little bit steeper. With a carving axe it's much better if it's just completely flat. So, you can remove a lot of material doing the normal filing way, but to finish off the edge, I'll use draw filing. So, you just hold the file up against the head like this and move it back and forth. And it's easy to find the angle if you put uh, a finger underneath the file, so my middle finger there, onto the axe head. That maintains the angle. You're just rocking it back and forth. And you should see the scratches go back and forth this way. And it's when you see the scratches going all the way to the edge, you've hit the edge. And you can do the same on the other side again, just the middle finger onto the eye area. It means that you'll get the same angle. It's really that easy. You can use a lot of pressure to move material fast. But uh, as you finish up, just lighten up on the pressure. Generally, I try and aim for about a 20 degree angle. It doesn't really matter though, as long as it's sharp and uh, flat. So just do light pressure now and hone it, just barely using the weight of the file. Back and forth about three strokes each, a couple of times.
down to one. That should be good. Can you, of course drop it now. I don't really see that as absolutely necessary. The carving axe, you can go a bit crazy with the stones and whatever, but uh, really a filed edge is all you need, so I'd encourage you to get good with filing before you go and spend a lot on Japanese stones and that sort of thing. Taking hairs off is all you need. So I'm just going to take the bark off first. Now I've got this cleaned up, I've got to decide where the bowl of my spoon is going to go and uh, where the handle is. So I think I'm going to make this is the bottom with the bowl. So I'm going to move a lot of material along here. You can see the handle there coming out now. One of the things I've found is if you try and use a hatchet with a convex ground, um, it wants to scoop more, so it'll kind of do this, where it doesn't bite into the wood at a steep angle, which is just frustrating and, uh, I don't know, you could call it dangerous as it slips off, it could uh, cause an accident. But uh, yeah, I prefer a flat grind and a bit thinner than normal. I found 20 degrees works really well, whereas most I've seen advertised are like 25, 30 degrees on the carving axe. I'm not sure why that is, but uh, I found 20 to be pretty good. So a bit more bite. And when the axe has more bite, you don't have to put as much force into it to make the cut. And uh, with less force, and smaller swings you can be more accurate and less likely to damage what you're working on. So I've got to take some material off the sides here and start to bring out the shape of the spoon. A bit more brutal than that. There we go. When doing that part in particular, I found it's uh, good to be a bit more brutal and make the cut in one or two hits rather than tapping away to get a smoother finish. Adjust it slightly, of course. Take some off the front now as well. Take a bit more of here as well. There we 
There we go, there's a small cut already. That's one thing I'll mention if you're doing carving. It sometimes helps to have uh, some plasters or first aid kits at hand because you'll get cuts. What happened there was I grabbed the top here and this uh, like line of splinters along here just got a little nick on me. But uh, when you're doing carving, it's inevitable, um, really. There's not much uh, you can do about it. I mean, the more experience you get, of course, you cut yourself less, but um, I found that uh, it's just one of those things. It's like uh, only a matter of time. So what you're doing is making a line of cuts going up the work and then splitting it off. Don't need the spoon to be that deep, so I'm going to split that bit off at the back. Yeah, that's a good size now. So you can see the shape cut starting to come out now. And now you can uh, start to reduce the power of your blows. With a lot of them I'm actually just sort of lifting it up and dropping it on to the piece. I'm not really adding in much force like I did at the start. So that's where that toe comes in handy I found just sticking in this bit here. What I'm going to do now is ignore the handle because I want to leave that a bit thicker until I'm getting to the finishing stages and I'm going to concentrate on working on the, the bowl of the spoon. Just going to take that sharp edge off so I don't nick myself again. And uh, just see what's happening. Take some of this out the back here. Okay, so now I've got to the stage where the spoon's very much roughed out and uh, can only need adjust adjusting with a knife. I start to carve out the bowl. Now these quick knives are great, they don't cost much but uh, they're very very effective. This is quite hard ash I'm carving so it's a bit more difficult than usual. If you can get some nice uh, softer wood to carve it helps a lot. You don't want to be carving anything dry that's hard like a beech or oak or even ash when it's dry is really really hard. So these work best I found when you're cutting it across the grain in like a scooping motion. If you try and go like this it just sort of tears out, sort of splits out the wood. You can also use these gouges. Now I found these work better when you're cutting dry wood and you can get a lot more torque into them but you've got to be really careful of these because they are absolutely deadly I had a bad accident once where I was scooping like this and just sort of you know zoning out and not really paying attention and I scooped out the wood and it then put the gouge through the side of my thumb so it opened up a big flap um, one of the nastiest cuts I've had and uh, it was a real bleeder so you've got to be really careful with these and 
perhaps think about clamping the piece down and then working on it. If you're just getting into it though, I'd say the, the knife is the better way to go. It's uh, a bit cleaner and uh, not as aggressive. It's quite easy with the gouge to end up destroying your work by taking it too far too quick. I forgot to mention, sometimes uh, these sort of cut proof gloves are quite good um, to help protect you. I found that they can be a hazard though because they prevent your grip being as effective. But uh, if you want to wear them, they are quite good. They're not going to stop an axe going through them, but uh, just light cuts, they will protect you a little bit. This bit's always a little bit tedious, but uh, it's worth taking your time um, and checking. I like to check the thickness throughout because as have been in the past a few occasions where I've got carried away and actually worn a hole through the wood. So it's a bit annoying when you've spent a quite a long time on making it and then uh, just to ruin it with one mistake like that. Okay, so now I've got the bowl carved out. It's just a case of doing the final touches to the spoon. Now for this stage I'll actually use the knife. So just adding some shape to the handle so it's more comfortable to hold than a square piece. And um, carving out in here to make a bit more of a transition between the bowl and the handle. Just for a bit of shape. And generally just going around and finding any extra thick areas and taking them off. And just any splits, see the splits there, grains running the, the wrong way so it's split out rather than cut cleanly and leave a smooth finish. So just go over that and tidy that up. Saves you a bit of sanding. So you see there's a few cuts I'm using. Really the primary cut you want to use is firm grip on the knife of your thumb behind the blade and holding the, the piece of work tight with nothing in front of your edge. And you can use both thumbs to really apply torque. Another thing I sometimes do is I'll put my knee or part of my leg and hold the knife firm and then just move them in the piece of work. That is a lot of control. Adds a lot of power as well because you can use a lot of your stronger muscles to pull this work back. Of course with sharp tools you don't need to use too much force and when the wood's green like this it's okay. With some softer woods it's just like butter and you can very very easily carve it but uh, in any case, you want to use as much control and low speed but high torque, if you know what I mean. You know, this kind of thing, see there we go, pulling away like and using like sort of ripping cuts, not great because you end up losing control and doing stuff you don't want to. So there we go, see there's trying to split off that bit, so I have to cut that out. Something you see in Hollywood and films and all that, but uh, not that useful in actual carving. The only times you might do that is to add a point to something, so, so cut like that. But other than that, it's much easier to use nice controlled cuts. So it's taking off this end grain where the saws cut it. Tidy it up a little bit, add a little bit of shape. Kind of like to leave the end a little bit uh, rough and rustic looking. I think it looks quite appealing when it's oiled. You see in general, you're also going around and see all these little bits here where it's raggedy grain, just cutting them out. Just saves the sanding process. But these Mora knives are fantastic, you really can't beat them. I've owned several of them and they're just such great knives. They're not very 
aesthetic looking as a wood handle or whatever, but they've got excellent grip. They are cheap as chips and um, they do everything you want to. Don't really see much reason to go out and spend more on a knife than these. Okay, you can get some nice aesthetic looking ones, but uh, for practicality, these are unbeatable. Easy to sharpen as well. There's plenty of videos on sharpening them over, but uh, they're the easiest knife you'll find that, to get into sharpening with. So there's not really a hell of a lot more I'll do to that other than uh, sand it and continue tidying it up. I don't like to leave them looking absolutely like perfect and as if they were made on a machine because I think that kind of defeats the purpose. I like to leave them a little bit rough and textured as far as um, you know uh, angles on the handle but I do sand them up to a really fine grit. Okay so that's the spoon pretty much finished there. All that needs to happen is some final tidying to the shape and uh, some sanding and then all I'll do is add a coat of olive oil to help uh, protect the wood and uh, stop it cracking and drying out. You want to use olive oil rather than linseed oil or any other kind um, basically because it's going to be used in the kitchen with food. You don't want to be ingesting boiled linseed oil, uh, it's pretty toxic so if you're going to use an oil always make sure that it's considered food safe the main thing with carving, as I say, is don't worry about it too much, just experiment, take your time, and uh, enjoy it. Stuff doesn't work out. Here was a spoon I was doing yesterday and I uh, accidentally cut through, making a hole in it. Um, so it just went in the firewood pile. So you do get frustrating moments, but just learn to learn from them and take it in your stride. It's, uh, don't let it ruin your day. Even though you might have spent hours on it, it's a, it's a learning experience. Now today I just use some basic tools such as a knife, axe and um, cook knife. But of course you can get more stuff. We'll also make these mini draw knives which are quite good. You can also, of course, get a selection of different uh, gouges, chisels, different knives. It's a fine chip carving knife. And this is a, a carver's mallet for driving chisels and gouges and stuff. A carver's mallet is slightly different. A carpenter's mallet has a square head with a flat surface. Carver's mallets are completely round. Looks a bit like a German hand grenade. But uh, one of the best things I've found is these bags. These are um, Polish army surplus. They're called a Polish bread bag. These just work incredibly well for carving tools I've found. It's got some inside pockets where you can keep your tools so you don't get cut and messed up. It's got a middle divider as well to keep your chisels separate and another side so I like to keep my carpenter's mallet on this side. You know you can keep some of your projects and uh, your gloves. Maybe a file and some stones in there as well. Some little pockets which can fit that sort of thing. It also has this flap on the front here which is stitched on, originally was stitched, but I just cut the stitching along the bottom here and I found that that is absolutely perfect um, if you like a, a small tomahawk. Obviously it doesn't work with this hatchet with a big palm saw, but if you've got a small tomahawk it can actually hook through here and uh, so the handle sticks at the bottom. If you cut the handle to length so it doesn't, so you've just got a small carving tomahawk, then when you stick it through there and then close the flap over. The edge is covered up and it's protected. So you have a nice little compact carving kit you can take with you and you've got everything you need. So I think you can still get these uh, from various military surplus places but just uh, something to keep an eye out for because they are a bloody good buy.
for this sort of thing. So I just wanted to show a bit more about this hatchet handle that I made. It's an old racing axe off cut, um, so that's where the giant palm saw comes from. And uh, it's really brilliant with this really large palm swirl. Hatchets often have a tendency, if you've over strike, the weight of it pulls it out of your hand and will go flying. So this extra large palm swirl just gives you that extra security, like it's pretty much impossible to, for it to fly out of your hand. Also, there's a bit more subtle things to the shape. This long straight section is ideal when you need accuracy. But there's a slight thicker area, the back here, so that when I'm feeling and moving the hatchet around in my hands, my hand will naturally go to the longer bit, which is about where a normal 14 inch hatchet is. Which is, I'd say, the majority of where you use it. So it naturally goes to that area, and then I have to move it forward again to go to the back and the back but it's only when you really need a lot of power it's like basically the same length as a framing hammer and you really need to remove a lot of wood quickly so anyway I've just got to add the final touches to these spoons I recommend that uh, everyone gives carving a go I find it quite a a uh, fun little project, even if you just do it once, you don't need to spend that much on tools. You can get uh, the Mora knife for about £10. The Crook knife costs, I think, about 10 15 if I remember rightly. And you can put together a hatchet quite easily for about £15. Particularly the Rydenand hatchets. Uh, I bought one for £10, uh, made by Bison. It was a red one, just a very, very generic, cheap um, German one made in Germany uh, and as long as they've got the DNI standard on them they should be perfectly serviceable quite a soft steel on it but I found it worked absolutely fine at 20 degrees flat grind in hard ash so I don't know what more you need you don't need to go with fancy gear especially when you're starting out and maybe you only got some files or some stones to maintain and sharpen the last thing you want to do is buy a hard Swedish axe, which a lot of them really need a belt sander to sharpen and maintain effectively. They're just too hard for files. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, perhaps inspires you to give it a go yourself. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to ask and maybe I'll answer them in another video. Thank you very much and uh, hope you enjoyed.